Aloha and welcome to Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kili'i Akina. Well, you know, as they say, the only thing you can count on for sure in life is death and taxes. At least during the legislative session, you can count on taxes, and that's what's going on right now. Our state legislature is convening in 2019, and we are taking a look at what's going on in terms of talking about taxes that may be increased, taxes that may actually be created and imposed upon the people of Hawaii. My guest today is an expert in the field. He's Tom Yamachika, the president of Tax Foundation of Hawaii, that does a lot of really good work of educating and informing the public of what's going on in the tax realm, and also educating our policy leaders. I love the fact that Tom is always down there at the legislature explaining what a bill does, what its intended and unintended consequences may be, and talking about how it's doing as a practice perhaps somewhere else in the country. But our guest today has a lot of keen insight about taxes, especially during this legislative session. So please join me in welcoming to the program Tom Yamachika. Tom, good to have you back on the program. Thanks for having me on the show, Kali'i. Well, you're not just a, an expert out there, you're also a friend, and I appreciate the work you do for everyone in Hawaii. It's a very important work. We, we try hard. Now, Tax Foundation of Hawaii has been around about how long? Uh, 60 years. 60 years? You don't look that old, but you weren't there at the beginning. I wasn't right there now. at the beginning, no. <laughs> and, and basically, you've been with the Tax Foundation about how long? Uh, so I started in 2014, so about five years. Is that right? And you were with the board prior to that of the Tax Foundation, so you jumped in when one of the, your very respected uh, members of the community passed away. That's right. My, my predecessor, Lowell Kalapa. Everyone knew Lowell Kalapa. Yeah, yeah. He, he ran the foundation for uh, you know, decades. Well, what does the foundation do, Tom? Well, what we, what we do is, as you know, I think you summarized it very eloquently, we um, try to educate uh, people and politicians alike on what the tax laws they are trying to vote on uh, actually accomplish or what, the, what they actually do. So sometimes, you know, t tax is a, a tough subject, so uh, sometimes people know what they're voting on, sometimes they're just following others, and we want to make sure that they're educated enough to uh, exercise their independent judgment and, uh, you know, vote purposefully as opposed to just blind. Um, and we uh, also of late have been trying to uh, do the same thing with the court, within the court system. That's right. Yeah, so we've been in, uh, getting involved as uh, a friend of the court in uh, a number of significant cases. In fact, I appreciate the fact that we've been able to go hand in hand Grassroot Institute, along with the Tax Foundation, it's been good to work together on a number of issues, even in terms of amicus briefs in the court. Speaking of which, there's a very famous case that has been going on perhaps a little longer than <laughs> you'd like, and that has to do with the general excise tax being having a 10% amount being skimmed by the state for administrative purposes as it relates to funding the rail. You want to summarize what that case is and tell us sure. where, it's at, um, where it's at? Yeah, well, as originally enacted, um, when the, uh, the half percent surcharge on our general excise tax took place, you know, ostensibly to fund the rail, uh, one point that, you know, wasn't really talked about too much uh, was the fact that the state was skimming off 10% off the top, uh, presumably for uh, administrative costs. But uh, it turns out that what they, what they skimmed off uh, was far more than any administrative uh, effort would require because uh, they skimmed off $25 million a year, and uh, that is comparable to the entire budget top to bottom of one whole department of taxation. So in order for them to administer just one measure, they were going to be collecting enough money to fund the department all over again. That's right. So, so uh, that's why we kind of stepped in and said, this is excessive, guys. Uh, something's, something's wrong here. And, uh, you know, we filed suit. Um, and the suit wound its way to the Supreme Court of Hawaii. We argued the case a couple of years ago. Uh, and we're still waiting for the decision. Well, I think that some people would have liked that skim just to have gone unnoticed. But then Tom Yamachika blew the whistle and 
What are you waiting for now? What's the latest status of the case? We're just waiting for the opinion. Okay. Well, we'll be waiting uh, very eagerly to see what the result is. Yeah, and, and, a lot and of we, we appreciate the fact that uh, Grassroot Institute uh, are going to meet us in our case. Well, you know, uh, one of the roles that you play is as a watchdog, so to speak, because taxes can be complex. It's often difficult to understand them, and they often have unintended consequences. Not only that, uh, they may be uh, promoted as achieving one end, but what's not said is what the negative things may happen. For example, we've got a GE tax uh, surcharge being proposed in the state legislature now, uh, about half a percent, in order to increase the monies that go to our Department of Education. Schools. And the UH. Yeah. And the University of Hawaii, that's right. But so, the, so the bill proposes to uh, basically hike the tax rate uh, half a percent, so from four to four and a half percent. That would be the base rate. So then you add individual county surcharges. So uh, in Honolulu, for example, we already have a half percent surcharge. So that would bring it up to five percent. Um, the same would happen on Kauai. Uh, from, on Maui, it would go from four to four and a half. On the Big Island, it would go from four and a quarter to four and three quarters. So that's what's being proposed. Now, um, I, I think what happened is, you know, we had a whole publicity campaign this past summer about you know, raising more funds for education through the property tax. Uh, and the, you know, the big issue had been not so much that you know there wasn't a problem in in our public schools. There is a problem, okay. uh, but the way in which the ballot measure was worded, uh, it was it was very you know um, misleading and deceptive, and and that, that's what the Hawaii Supreme Court found, and that's why they, they they kicked it off the ballot. Well, you know what's interesting here is that things are not always what seems to meet the eye. Uh, uh, the people of Hawaii, the good people of Hawaii, all of the people, certainly are sympathetic toward the importance of providing good salaries to our teachers and quality education to our keiki. And so the measure you're talking about this past summer in terms of using property taxes to fund the Department of Education had a lot of sympathy with the in intended ostensible outcome. But it's not always the case that a measure that is proposed will have that outcome. Let's talk a bit about this GE tax. Is there any assurance that increasing GE tax revenues to the educators, I mean, to the educational establishment in our state is going to result in better salaries for teachers? Not at all. Um, there, there wasn't even any assurance that more money would go to the Department of Education. And, and let, me, let me explain why. Um, the... Uh, You're talking back about the property tax measure? Uh, both. Both. Okay, because and the current both, GE tax. Yeah, because both the property tax measure and, and the current one on GE tax would establish a special fund that's to be used only for education. So you're telling me that this bill is up for uh, voting on in the state legislature soon, potentially, and it doesn't say inside of it that if it passes... The money will go to give higher salaries to teachers. No, of course not. It doesn't say that at all. No, it it's, it, it creates the special fund mm -hmm. that can be used for education, right, and only for education. You know, I mean, that's perhaps well and good, but uh, the reality is that the DOE gets maybe two billion dollars of of uh, general fund money as is. Well, to me, that sounds like an excellent idea if the DOE has already shown that with the billions it has received, it has done an excellent job. You always want to give more money to in institutions that are doing well with the money that they have already. But has it been shown that the DOE has done an outstanding job with its funding already? Well, it hasn't. That, that's the second issue. So the first issue is, will the, will, under either bill, would DOE get more money? Not necessarily so, because, like I, like I mentioned, they have that uh, $2 billion already right. being appropriated, and you have the special fund coming into existence. It, um, 
it would be very easy for legislators to say, okay, well, let's, let's cut some of that, one, that, that two billion for general fund money and, and repurpose it. We, gotta, we have other priorities in the state. We have invasive species, we have the homeless, we have you know, uh, all these other things. We wanna be a sanctuary city, uh, you know, a sanctuary state. Uh, all these things we have to you know, deal with climate change, all these things we have to accomplish. Uh, so if, let's say, a um, quarter billion dollars goes into the special fund, what's to say that a quarter billion dollars of general fund money won't be repurposed? We don't know. Okay? That's, that's problem number one. Problem number two is there's, there's some dispute about whether the Department of Education is, is effectively and efficiently using the $2 billion that it does have. Uh, one of the things that we pointed out um, in, in an article that, that came out to, you know, during the summertime was, hey, there's federal money available um, you know, for, for certain things that, that most uh, school systems in the U.S. are, are pulling down. Specifically, uh, you know, we provide for mental health services uh, for, you know, for needy kids. And there's federal money available for that. Right. Most states pull down, you know, 40 to $60 million. We pull down 500000 500000 Is that because we're not qualified for more? Or is it because we simply don't, in the proper way, go after it? And that I, I, I think it's because we didn't go after it properly. Um, there's a, there's a lot of paperwork that has to be, or a lot of st bureaucratic steps that have to be jumped through to you know, access that, that federal money. Um, I don't think we did it. Well, let's talk a little bit about the mechanism being proposed to raise funds for the Department of Education, quite apart from whether it actually needs that money. W what is problematic about increasing the GE tax? And, and how does that really impact all residents, including teachers in the state. Well, um, as as you are probably aware, the GET is not only our sales tax equivalent, but it goes deeper than that. And um, uh, so, whenever you go to the store, whenever you buy a service or a good or almost anything else, uh, you're going to be you're going to be charged some GE tax because that's what your store gets gets hit with, and they pass. You know, and, and they pass it on to you. So the number itself, somewhere above four, it sounds very small as a percentage point, but it's very pervasive. It's yeah, everywhere. It, it, it applies to everything. It applies to uh, goods. It applies to services. It applies to rent. It applies to royalties. Uh, it applies to interest, which, you know, m most of those latter things, uh, sales tax systems elsewhere in the U.S. don't touch them. They usually focus on sales of tangible personal property you know, or sales of goods. You know? They don't touch the services, they don't touch the royalties, they don't touch the rents. Ours does. So it's not limited like an income tax to what your income happens to be. You get hit with the GET every single time you make one of these purchases. Right. It's, it's imposed on the business, so whenever the business makes a sale, mm -hmm. tax needs to be paid. It doesn't, doesn't matter whether the business makes money or loses money. About, based on the gross price. About how much of our state budget comes from the GET? Roughly half. About half of it. Now, that's an astounding figure. You know, when I share that with people for the first time, they're shocked. Imagine that there's this one little tax instrument that funds half of the state budget. How is that so? Well, it, like, uh, like you said, it, it applies everywhere. So it's, it's very easy to hide. Mm -hmm. um, not only is it stated on the receipt when you buy something, but it's also buried in the costs uh, and, and it's included in the, in the gross price of the, the goods and services that you buy. For example, um, when, uh, when, when you go down to this, this big store and that big store has to pay rent, GET is imposed on the rent, so it gets built into the store's costs. Well, you know, Tom, when you come back from a break, I'm, I'm going to ask you, how that impacts those earning lower amounts of income. A lot of times it's said that our teachers aren't earning a lot of money, that they're not at the high end of income earning. How does the GET attack those at the lower ends of income earning? My guest today is Tom Yamachika, president of the Tax Foundation of Hawaii. We're having a very interesting talk about some of the taxes down at the legislature 
we're talking about education and the GE tax now, but we'll come back and talk about some other taxes as well. Don't go away. Aloha. This is Winston Welch. I am your host of Out and About, where every other week, Mondays at 3, we explore a variety of topics in our city, state, nation, and world, and uh, events, organizations, the people that fuel them. It's a really interesting show. We welcome you to tune in, and we welcome your suggestions for shows. Um, you got a lot of them out there, and we have an awesome a studio here where we can get your ideas out as well. So I look forward to you tuning in every other week where we've got some great guests and great topics. You're going to learn a lot. You're going to come away inspired like I do. So I'll see you every other week here at three o'clock on Monday afternoon. Aloha. I'm Jay Fidel of ThinkTech. Our flagship energy show among the six energy shows we have is Hawaii, the state of clean energy. It plays every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Come around and see us. Learn about energy. Keep current on energy on thinktechhawaii.com. Welcome back again to Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kili'i Akina. My guest today is Tom Yamachika, president of the Tax Foundation of Hawaii. We've been talking about the taxes down at the legislature being considered this term, and one in particular seems quite onerous, and that's the increasing of the GET. I'm going to ask Tom an important question. Tom, people say raising the GET won't be felt. It's just a tiny fraction of a percentage. It's uh, a tax that is so small that it's almost unnoticeable. How does the GET really impact the consumer? especially those who don't have a lot of income. Well, um, you, you said it, Kali'i, it's uh, death by a thousand needle pricks. Um, oh, I see you read my grassroots column. <laughs> <laughs> I do, actually. Um, the thing is, as, as we mentioned, the GET applies to pretty much all sales of goods and services. Uh, even those, those goods and services that we would consider necessities. So you go to the supermarket, you buy food, um, you know, uh, you buy clothing, all of that's taxable. Okay, uh, and does it does it affect everybody equally? No, because people who don't have as much money still have to pay for food and and clothing and other other necessities, pay rent, um, and that turns out to be a larger proportion of, uh, of, of what they make. So, uh, some, uh, you know, there, there's a study done a couple of years ago uh, that said the, uh, the tax burden here in Hawaii falls upon, uh, you know, the poorest of our population, basically double in the proportion that it falls on the rich people. Like, so uh, a rich person would a maybe 7% of uh, their personal income in state tax, but the, the poor people would pay 14%. And, and the reason for that uh, is, is the GET. So if one of the problems that we're trying to solve is the low wages that our teachers get, raising the GET is actually going to make the economy more difficult for them to live in, and it's going to impact them more than it will impact those who have higher wages. This is what we call regressive, isn't it? That's right. That, that's, uh, the GET is a regressive tax. Well, I'm glad you're down there at the legislature helping to instruct our legislators <laughs> about the regressive nature. Now, there's another issue that's often thorny, and it has to do with transient accommodation, vacation rentals. And I think a lot of times the public doesn't realize the difficulty is because we're dealing with different jurisdictions. We're dealing with the state and we're dealing with the counties, and, and they're not always in, in harmony. What's going on in terms of some legislation being considered in this area? Well, sure. Um, for the last several years, there have been you know, constant bickering between the state and the counties because uh, you know, in, in, in the old days when the transient accommodations tax was established, uh, the counties persuaded the state to you know, give, them, give them some of the money. So... Uh, in, I think, the early 2000s, the state began giving them a percentage of the TAT collections. 
and uh, that that money grew over time, mm -hmm. and the tax rates grew over time, and you know finally uh, in 2013 or so they said, well, um, uh, we you know we really want uh, a a revenue source that is stable and predictable. That was the wrong thing to say, because they then gave them a fixed number that didn't rise with the, you know, with the GET collections, and the rate went up too. So that's, that's, that's when, that's when um, our, our, G, our t transient accommodations rate went up to nine and a quarter. Now, the counties, of course, are, are, are saying that the state makes out like a bandit, but the counties are left without income that they need for their roads, for their services, and other things that visitors actually use. There's a, a bill now in place, SB 631, I believe. What's it trying to propose? Well, you know how uh, the, the counties can enact a surcharge on GE tax, and mm -hmm. you know, Honolulu uh, uh, did that for rail. Uh, the other counties have jumped in. Kauai now has the same amount as Honolulu, and uh, Big Island has a you know half of that amount, and Maui hasn't surcharged anything yet, but. The bill proposes to do the same thing to the hotel room tax, so that each county would be allowed to surcharge the transient accommodations tax you know, within certain limits, and, and those limits aren't set yet. Um, but that's basically the idea. You know, rather than coming to the state and compl you know, comply, uh, complaining and crying all the time, you know, fine, take your destiny in your own hands, you enact your surcharge, you collect it, see how it feels. How should the public interpret what's going on here? What are quickly the pros and the cons of that measure? Well, uh, it's always kind of going to be a push and pull between the visitor industry and and kind of you know the rest of us on goods and services. Uh, sure, we want our counties to have adequate funds to you know maintain our roads and fix our potholes and uh, bridges and you know, give us good city services, take our trash away, and that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, at the same time, we don't want, you know, to, to um, scare all of our visitors away so that they go to, you know, Bermuda or Mexico or, or Puerto Rico or, you know, someplace uh, with, you know, similar kind of uh, climate, but, uh, but not here. Right. Now, there are some fuel tax measures that are a bit confusing to the average person, in fact, to the legislature. I would say that I'm confused by them, too. But uh, there's one in particular, SB 1463, that is talking about shifting from taxing barrels, barrel tax, to taxing carbon emissions. Do you want to explain what that is all about? And give us sure. a little background. Um, right now, we have, you know, a number of different tax systems that operate against fuel. Okay? So we have a fuel tax, which is um, applied at certain specified rates on gasoline, for example. Uh, and, and, and the thing about the fuel tax is state can impose one, the counties can impose one, right? Um, but, the, but the rates are set for each type of fuel. Okay, so you have a, a rate for gasoline, you have a rate for kerosene, you have a rate for a diesel fuel, you have, you have a different rate for aviation fuel, you have a different rate for um, you know, other kinds of things. But the, the one unifying theme of, of all of that is it's for road usage. Right? So uh, it doesn't apply if you're using the fuel to do something that's not using the highways. For example, generating electricity. Or, or working on the farm, okay? You you you, you operate a you know a farm tractor. You're not using the roads, so so there are exemptions for, uh, you know, for both of those right. uses. Now, let me just on top of that interrupt you before sure. you go on to your, your your point there. What what's the relative usage between fuel that is used on the road versus fuel that is used not on the road? Um, Which is the larger group category? I, I would think it's on the road, but. Uh, but I haven't seen those figures in a while. Sure. Well, you yeah. go ahead. You were saying on top yeah. of this. So on top of that, they have this thing called the barrel tax. And what the barrel tax was initially supposed to do was to, was to you know, collect money for a, a 
a disaster fund to be used in case uh, we had an Exxon Valdez type disaster and you know have had all this crude washing up on our beaches. Um, but over time, it it, it kind of morphed and you know got a lot bigger, and and is now basically imposed whenever you have a fossil fuel that enters the state. And uh, even if it's not um, used, whether it's used in the highways or not is irrelevant. By the way, has this barrel tax, which was ostensibly put in place in order to protect us from an environmental catastrophe, has it created a fund that we have sitting in our bank at the state? Several different ones. It feeds several different funds. Some, some in the Department of Land and Natural Resources, uh, some in Department of Health. And, you know, there, there are, like, I think, five or six different earmarks on the fund. And are those funds just sitting there waiting for the disaster? Uh, no. Uh, they're being used. They're being used for other purposes? Uh, they're being used to protect food security. They're, they're being used to um, protect the environment. Um, the, uh, uh, the Department of Land and Natural Resources has conservation officers. You know, somebody has to pay their salaries. You know, that's one of the uses. So that's... it's become an important part of maintaining the budget of the state. Yes. Well, I cut you off here. If you continue to tell us about that. Sure. So the, propose, the, the proposal is for a carbon tax. And what that would do is it would replace the two taxes that I talked about, the fuel tax mm -hmm. and the barrel tax, and it would uh, replace it with a carbon tax, which is based on the carbon content of the fuel that you're burning. So there's a higher rate for coal, um, different rate for uh, diesel fuel, a different rate for kerosene, all pegged to the carbon emissions that happen when the fuel is burned. Is this a good measure? It depends. You know, um, there are going to be winners and losers. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the losers may be the electric companies because uh, Electric companies have this big exemption from fuel tax because they don't use the road, but a carbon tax doesn't depend on whether they're using the road or not. How is the taxpayer ultimately affected? Uh, if the ordinary citizen. Well, if, for example, the uh, the electricity burning is taxed, uh, it'll it'll find its way to your electric rates uh, sooner rather than later. So everything affects the individual. Oh, of course, everything trickles down. Well, Tom, there are more taxes to talk about, unfortunately, than we have time. And hopefully their legislature won't go on and impose too many hikes on us. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you, Kali. Appreciate it. I do appreciate having my guest, Tom Yamachika, president of Tax Foundation of Hawaii, with us. I'm Kali Iakina at the Grassroot Institute. Until next time, aloha from Hawaii together on the ThinkTech Hawaii Broadcast Network.